Check if I remember correctly, but being talking about it, seeing that's true. But so he was, um, and I think to a certain extent, remained something of an outsider in in professional philosophy. Um, all his degrees were in physics after his PhD. So, um, um, and then he switched to history and philosophy of science kind of on his own. <laughs> I mean, if you read the like uh, preface, you know, or acknowledgments or whatever it's titled, you see it wasn't completely on his own. He had, he had a lot of support to do it, but. Um, um, but, you know, he never uh, went through the philosophical, official philosophical education. <laughs> um, although he did go on to hold uh, positions in prestigious places like uh, Berkeley and Princeton and finally MIT. Um, but I think my sense is that he was never completely part of the culture in those philosophy department really was. Um, and uh, I think this is still true, that to this day in philosophy, maybe it's less true than it used to be, but that in philosophy, as opposed to maybe some parts of the social sciences or other areas, he's um, kind of regarded more as having raised some problems that have to be solved. <laughs> right? It's like a kind of puzzle. Uh, use a term that he uses a lot. Um, rather than a figure to be like inherited or, you know, like an authority of some kind. Um, um, So, and this book doesn't sound exactly like books that were being written by philosophers around this time. I don't know exactly how to put my finger on what the difference is, like, but it's a different kind of book. Um, uh, why am I telling you stuff like that? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, so, I mean, because obviously I think this book is important, or I wouldn't have said it. And I guess I should say something else about uh, like why this book is in the proper half of the course, right? So, there's like two parts of the course, as I said at the very beginning. I'm, I'm never sure whether people actually at the end of the course feel like they understand why I divided it that way or not. But, um, you know, one side was like Carnap, Goodman, and Klein. And the other side is basically Hopper and Pink. And I mean, so there's something a little weird about this. Um, Kuhn says that. Um, he hadn't read anything by Popper until the English translation of Logic of Scientific Discovery appeared in 1959. Um, so he had heard him lecture at Harvard in 1950. So he had heard Popper, you know, say things, but he hadn't read anything by him. And then by 1959, um, the 
the structure of scientific revolutions was quote unquote already in draft. Now, I mean, evidently the draft was revived because the, the published version of Popper actually is mentioned and there's a citation to the logic of scientific discovery on uh, page 146 to 7. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think um, it would be strange to read, to read this book as like a direct attack on Topo because he apparently wasn't that uh, familiar with Popper in detail when he wrote it. Still, um, if you ask what this book is an attack on, um, well, it's an attack on received views about natural science, as Kuhn says. But um, natural science in that statement doesn't mean like um, the sum of all statements that are cognitively meaningful, <laughs> right? Like the way Carnap uses it to include, uh, you know, graphology and art criticism and anything that he thinks in principle can be reduced to observation statements, right? This um, book is uh, an attack on certain views about what Popper calls the demarcation problem and methodology, right? Like it's, what is it that makes science, properly speaking, different from, as Kuhn always says, other creative fields? I'm not really sure what that word creative is supposed to mean anymore, but he always adds it. <laughs> science versus other creative fields. Um, and, um, and, like in some sense, Kuhn agrees with Popper that what makes it different is kind of uh, rules of science or something like that. Um, I mean, rules maybe is the wrong word. Uh, I mean, it's definitely the wrong word. Kuhn talks at length about why rules are not the primary, uh, the thing of primary importance here, but it's something broadly speaking about methodology, right? Like. Um, about uh, what it is that scientists do that makes their activity scientific. Or uh, as Kuhn um, usually qualifies this, what he's interested in is what makes something a mature science. Right, he's willing to. He's willing to. In fact, he thinks we like must use the the term science and scientist more broadly than this to cover people who um, are studying the kind of things that would be studied in a mature science, but are not. Don't have a mature science, or at least that's at least one example, right? So he says that you know, um, medieval writers on uh, optics have to be regarded as scientists, even though what they have, the activity they're part of, isn't exactly a science or isn't a mature science, right? So, I mean, this this is what he's interested in. He's interested, and I, I think, roughly speaking, what goes in this box is the same thing that goes in Popper's box that he calls the science. Or it's supposed to be, roughly speaking, the same thing except for engineering, which I've already mentioned, it's an uh, important difference between the two, right? That Kuhn, for Kuhn, engineering is gonna be outside the demarcation, whereas for Popper, seemingly engineering is inside the demarcation. Um, um, and, you know, um, his motive for thinking that it must be something about what scientists do, about methodology, broadly speaking, that makes something a mature science. Maybe, I mean, I should say something about this word mature, right? Like, so, you know, this implies that a mature science is something you get later in the development, right? Like, it's a result of growing up. <laughs> um, 
and Ku, uh, whether Popper agrees with this is a good question. I'm not really sure he does, but um, but Kuhn and a lot of people pretty much explicitly um, think that that's the case, right? So Kuhn says, like, since ant antiquity, one field after another has crossed the threshold and become a mature science. So, like, first it was mathematics and astronomy, and then dynamics, and so on and so forth. He has a whole like hierarchy. And you know, most recent was uh, you know certain parts of biology, and then the social sciences. It's not clear they're mature yet, but the idea is that certainly, like, they could become mature, and maybe they, they probably will become mature. Um, again, that seems to be implied in the term mature, right? Like, mature is something that, like. Well, mature is something that you at least expect to happen to someone as they get older, depending on exactly what you mean by mature, or it may be what necessarily happens as they get older. Yeah. This uh, notion of maturity is true, presupposes kind of like catastrophic progress in time. Well, uh, for for I'm not sure it depends on you like trans historical like the notion of like universal progress by the next you know, this, 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 I feel maturity uh, does seem to imply that but I'm, I'm, well okay so I mean maybe that's what I'm about to is related to what I'm about to talk about why is it that he thinks that in like in agreement with Popper thinks that something like methodology must be the demarcation criteria the thing that marks off mature sciences from other creative fields, because um, what marks it off is not like being right, <laughs> right? It's not like the, the transition to mature science is the transition to knowing the right answer. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, it's the, really the same type of examples, and, and at least uh, in some cases, the exact same examples that Popper is thinking of, that Kuhn is also thinking of when he says this. So, right, like, I mean, he talks about these old, uh, outdated scientific theories, like Newtonian mechanics. Um, but also other things like logistic chemistry. And uh, or thermodynamics. And I'm writing these down here because I mean Right. <laughs> um, so um, I'm writing these down because you know he's going to talk about them. He already talked about them a lot in this reading. We, uh, you know, phlogiston chemistry was a theory that um, um, there's this substance called phlogiston that. Um, uh, so like a metal is a compound of an earth and phlogiston. All the metals are compounds of earth and phlogiston. And when you heat them up, the phlogiston escapes <laughs> and you're left with the earth, what we would call the metal oxide, right? But we, we call it the metal oxide because we think when you heat the metal up in an oxygen, containing atmosphere, oxygen combines with the metal to form the oxide. But the phlogiston theory thinks that when you heat it up, in the air that doesn't already contain too much phlogiston, the um, phlogiston leaves, right? And so we think of the product as a compound, of metal and oxygen, but they think that you're starting off with a compound of metal and phlogiston. Right. So, um, I mean, there's more to phlogiston chemistry than that, but that's the basic idea. Um, 
So, um, and caloric thermodynamics was the idea that there's this, again, substance that they call caloric, which is basically supposed to be what we normally call heat. And, you know, um, when things change temperature, it's because caloric has flowed from one thing to another. And, you know, things have a heat capacity, which is like how much caloric they can hold and so on and so forth. So, I mean, um, um, it turns out there is no such C. It's hard to know how to talk about this, especially if, like, I want to leave things open to the way Clean is going to think about it. Um, even though I don't really think about it that way. So, like, I'm comfortable saying it turns out there is no such thing as focus. They were wrong. I think Kuhn will say that, but there's kind of an asterisk next to it. And we'll see as we go along what, what the asterisk is. So, um, but, you know, and similarly, I would say there's no, turns out there's no such thing as caloric, right? Like heat is, um, the quantity of heat is not conserved. Um, so that it can't be identified with something that flows around. Um, and moreover, you know, based on statistical you know, thermodynamics, we have a completely different understanding of what's going on when things, you know, change temperature, right? So, and Newtonian mechanics, of course, was overthrown in part by relativity and in part by quantum mechanics. Um, and, to this day, we don't know exactly how to put relativity and quantum mechanics together. <laughs> but in any case, um, so uh, so Kuhn says, talking about these type of out-of-date theories, this is on page two. And by the way, I can't find my hard copy of this book. Hmm. I'm sure I saw it recently and I was like, I'm going to need that. I better put it somewhere where I'll find it. But then I did, evidently, because I can't find it. But fortunately, I have a PDF, so I'm going to read the PDF. Um, so this is on page two. If these out of date beliefs are to be called myths, then myths can be produced by the same sort of methods and held for the same sorts of reasons that now lead to scientific knowledge. If, on the other hand, they are to be called science, then science has included bodies of belief quite incompatible with the ones we hold today. Given these alternatives, the historian must choose the latter. Right? So Kuhn is saying um, you can't regard, I mean, I think in a way it's this case that drives everyone in this direction. Like people were pretty happy saying that these were just like kind of superstitious. Or they thought there was this thing called phlogiston that no one had ever seen it, and they were, you know, whatever. Um, but when it came to Newtonian mechanics, like no one wanted to say that. <laughs> so, but so in any case, um, but so Kuhn and Popper says the same thing. He says, hey, look, you know. Uh, Although Popper doesn't say it from the point of view of a historian, which Kuhn takes up here, right? But they say the same thing. Look, these things, these people who had these theories were just as scientific as people are now. Um, yes, their theories were eventually overturned, but um, nevertheless, if we're going to have a demarcation criterion and say what counts as science and what doesn't, these people had better be inside, not outside. So we can't tell the difference between scientists and non-scientists based on whether they have correct beliefs. And so the progress of science from immaturity to maturity is not, um, uh, at least not in any direct way, a progress from knowing less about the world to knowing more about it. And in fact, for both Kuhn and Popper, but for different reasons, it's really not, right? I mean, you know, for Popper, 
the progress to becoming scientific means setting up a guest <laughs> of a certain time. Yeah. So what is defined as a science has something to do with methodology. That's what it seems like Kuhn is going for. But like, how can you explain something like phlogiston like chemistry, which there really wasn't a methodology, it was kind of just a guess. Or like, there was no way to prove it or even like test it, I feel like. So how, how could that be considered a science? Is well, that... I mean, so Kuhn knows more about the history of phlogiston chemistry than I do. Um, so I kind of, which I, I know, Almost everything I know about it, I either just told you or I know from Kuhn. <laughs> so, so I mean, I, so you should maybe take this with a grain of salt. But it, like, at least according to Kuhn, that's not true. They had experiments. They had you know theories that matched observations, and you know, I mean, they could observe. They could explain a lot of things. Um, for example, they could explain what all metals have in common. The um, post Lavoisier, post the revolution, there was no explanation of that anymore until quantum mechanics. <laughs> right now, we again have an explanation of what metals have in common, having to do with like electrons being in the conduction band and whatever, right? But like for all that time in between, there was there was no explanation, whereas the phlogiston chemists had a perfectly good explanation. Um, and you know they were able to so like uh, like roasting metals was um, a weird a hard case for them because the metals seemed to decrease in sorry seemed to increase in mass as it was replaced by what we call the oxide but but they there were a lot of other cases for, where for reasons like I forget. Who discusses this? And I forget exactly what the case is, but there are other cases where, where things seem to decrease in mass when you heat them up. You know, um, well, I mean, just like think about, you know, burning a piece of wood, something comes out. What you're left with has less mass. So what came out was phlogiston. Well, they could explain that. Now, I mean, you know, we, we can also explain that as for the kind of explanation is more complicated, but so um yeah, so I don't, I, I don't think Kuhn would agree that these were just guesses in the sense that, you know, current day theories are not. And of course, Popper would, right? Popper would say, yes, they were just guesses, just like our current day theories. <laughs> um, and if you ask them, well, how, if you ask Popper, how can you tell that they were scientific? You say, well, look, they were falsified, right? <laughs> Um, so, um, and I mean, I assume you wouldn't say, although in some ways this would fit the best, right? But like, how did Newton get the idea for the square law of gravitation? Yes, <laughs> I'm sure that's not exactly true, but yeah, so, um, yeah, so no, I, I don't think that's right. In any case, Kuhn and Popper's attitude towards these theories is predicated on the assumption that it's not right. And Kuhn's case, like he's done a at least he's done a lot of historical research. He thinks that these people look just like our scientists, more or less, but they they just happen to hold a view that uh you know, they, they have to have a theory that you now think is wrong. Um, so, Ray, I mean, if we contrast this to, to Carnap, what does Carnap think about immature sciences? I mean, I, first of all, like, um, Carnap and the other Vienna Circle people are pretty friendly to social science. You know, it's not just Carnap, but all of them routinely include psychology and sociology and whatever in their list of sciences. Um, and, uh, and as far as them being in some way, maybe not completely mature, I think, you know, as Carnap thinks that that's 
That might be true, but it's philosophically uninteresting because the problem has already been solved in principle. <laughs> like, you know, that's why he's fine in the later parts of the alpha. Uh, I mean, I didn't assign most of, or any of this maybe, but he's fine saying, you know, um, yeah, you know, somehow, how do we know about cultural entities? Well, it has something to do with, you know, psychological entities being manifestations of them and the details remain to be worked out, right? But in principle, the problem has been solved. So as far as he's concerned, like as far as Carnap is concerned, and I mean, I think really the same goes for Quine, right? Like, I mean, it's maybe in some ways it's even more straight striking in Quine's case because he says, you know, oh, so epistemology now appears as a chapter of natural science under the heading of psychology. And as I think I pointed out when I talked about this, it's not like psychology really knows very much about the questions that Quine is asking, <laughs> right? I mean, um, you know, how is it that from the, you know, I guess maybe in some ways we know a little bit more now than we did that, maybe even a lot more now than we did that, but like, how is it that we go from the input of our senses, like the process that leads from that to the, all the senses we produce, <laughs> right? Like that's, you know, I mean, uh, to, to describe them in any kind of detail is, is certain, at least way beyond the um, abilities of current neuropsychology. So, but again, that doesn't bother Klein because it's just like in principle, that's a psychological problem. <laughs> so we can file it away and then we're done. Um, so, I mean, this is all like, well, I got into some other things as an aside. This is all by way of explaining why I think Kuhn is basically a response to Popper. Um, um, and if you ask, well, how did that happen if you didn't read Popper? Well, Popper was influential. So, you know, I mean, Popper's students and whatever, like Kuhn was, um, in fact, he mentions Paul Feyerabend, who was an important student of Popper's, who disagreed with him in some ways, but that he had a lot of personal interaction with Feyerabend while he was writing the book. Yeah. I was like, good man, didn't even talk about Why is good man in Carnap Um, I mean, so it would be easier. To, it would be easy to answer and say, "Well, Goodman is clearly talking about Carnap, thinking about Carnap, and he's you know like collaborator with Quine. These people are part of the same tradition." And Goodman wrote a book. Right, the structure of appearance that was supposed to be like redoing the alpha better. <laughs> um, but, but to answer in terms of actual content of what he's talking about, I mean, so, I mean, and I, I haven't completely done that on this side either, that, you know, the, I know um, that, uh, This, some people are still having trouble with this, and I, I mean, obviously, it's because I can't explain it as well as I should. But, like, right, this 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 distinction is like is is the way I think about the difference between these two two traditions. And you know, these people are thinking that science, meaning not just mature science, but all kinds of every kind of knowledge about the world we can have basically is characterized by having the right concepts right and so like Carnap, you know develops a way of doing that where you say well we start with some concepts that we know we have a right to and then we like logically build up other concepts by by uh, um, a kind of definition and Goodman is a reaction against that saying well that's not going to work look at this example of group um the, the you know the relationship between Goodman is saying and Popper's considerations is, is much more indirect and 
complicated. And like, and I, and like I said before, I'm not even sure where Copper talked about her. She must somewhere. Yeah. I feel like we find this whole thing about like the whole theory thing that like, maybe the meeting also finds in Copper. Do you think like I I mean why is it a separate path, separate like column, just like you know, <laughs> theory or columns or whatever? Yeah. So I feel like it can apply, it can apply partially to copper like kind of having to act with us. Well, so first of all, it's interesting. There is a Klein contribution to the popper chill volume. It's very short and it's basically um, friendly. It's like, oh yeah, popper is right. There is this asymmetry between justification and falsification. And popper's res response is, is, you know, also really short. It's like, I thank Professor Klein for this kind words or something like that. Right. So, I mean, um, so, I mean, these are, these columns aren't supposed to be people that agree with each other, right? These are, I mean, Kuhn is attacking Popper, right? Quine is, and Whitman are attacking Quine. Uh, but I think they are, Quine is directly attacking Quine. You know, like that point about meaning holism, which at least as Quine understands Quine is, um, um, fatal to Carnap's project. It's Carnap wants to explain which sentences are good by showing that they contain meaningful terms and that the others don't. Um, for Popper, it's not really a direct problem at all, if it's any problem, right? I mean, Popper never claimed that you could tell the difference between the parts of a theory that were. Yeah, I mean, it's, he always said that the, that the theory as a whole has to be falsified. So I, you know, and and he's and he and he always said that it doesn't matter what concepts he uses, right? So that's why I think really sometimes he's um, pretty uh, sometimes he's pretty insistent about that. You know, concepts don't matter. What matters is whether you what you say is responsible in the sense that you can be forced to give it up. And that's, you know, that has to do with things that can be true or false, propositions, right? So Popper says, you know, science is not a structure of concepts, it's a structure of propositions. Yeah. So you say that, you know, to me, the concept distinction is like a more like abstract one here. If you have the meaning concept before, they're using implanted science for and then offering a kind of more material way to take a stand. Then from that stand that you take that 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 that, that is small to begin. It's also worried about like like I'm just curious about like lack of coach, like Nora and um <laughs> well I mean lack of coach definitely belongs in here, right? And that's that's for sure. Putnam and Noira, you know, I think um um Especially Putnam is kind of outside of both of these groups and is criticizing both of them, as he says. You know, Neura, it's more complicated. He thinks of himself as close to Karnak, but um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not claiming that this is a classification of all possible philosophers. <laughs> I'm just claiming that these are two, the, the two most important traditions in a certain time period, and it's an important time period. It's like when what we now call philosophy of science was started, basically. And yeah, so what I was going to say about Kuhn is, of course, Kuhn is going to say that scientists spend a lot of time trying to stuff nature into certain conceptual boxes. But that's in no way, that's not so much an agreement with Carnap as it is an attack on Pop. Right? It's saying that you know scientists are not following the methodology that according to Papa they should. They do care about concepts more than they care about the truth or falsehood, for, you know, like whether certain tests come out a certain way or not. Um, so yeah, that's my overall justification for it. I'm sure there could be other ways of. I mean, I think, you know, in this case, especially the historical connection is really small, right? So in this case, as I've just been saying, it's a little bit more, um, 
and she even, and obviously someone could come up with a different way of explaining what, what's going on inside, but that's the way I think about it. Anyway. All right. Um, okay, so that, are there more questions about this? Like, this, this is like, you know, Abe Stone's classification. <laughs> All right, so, um, I should not this stuff. I'll raise that. So, um, okay, so, uh, Kuhn is, all right, so, so Kuhn, like Popper, is talking about the methodology or something like methodology that makes mature science different from other creative fields and obviously so what he is gonna what he, he needs to explain what everyone wants to explain is why science makes progress but also part of that is explaining what scientific progress is um, so i mean um those two things go together, right? And when you give uh, an unexpected answer to one, you probably get an unexpected answer to the other, as in Popper's case, right? His explanation of why science, science makes progress goes along with an unexpected description of what kind of progress it's making. Um, all right, so the same thing is going to be true of Kuhn. Um, but and so I'm going to start talking about the details of both like the received views of science that he's reacting against and then of course going into what he thinks is the right way to do it. But before getting into the details, there's just this important general question about who, which is so mature science so I mean he basically says what the mature sciences are. Physical sciences, well, mathematics includes. I mean, it's interesting, mathematics uh, isn't really empirical, but uh, for Kuhn's criterion, that doesn't make that much difference. So, like, actually, I mean, Popper will take mathematics. And Carnap too, really, will take mathematics and put it outside of the equation. Right? They think it's part of logic and it doesn't have its own theoretical content. Everything it says is like a logical truism, a tautology. Um, from Kuhn's point of view, where he's more interested in how the practitioners are educated and how they interact with each other, mathematics to him seems to belong on the list. But anyway, so there's physical sciences. Biological sciences. And apparently that's it. Right? I mean, you know, maybe arts of psychology. Um, this doesn't mean that the other people doing other things that call themselves scientists are not scientists, according to Kuhn, but it means that they don't have a science or don't have a mature science. Um, so, um, okay, so what's not on this list is history or philosophy of science. And not surprisingly, I mean, who would say that? And I'm writing both of these because it's not clear which one who is doing. Also, sometimes it seems like he's doing sociology of science. Um, it's not clear exactly which one of these he's doing, but anyway, it's somewhere in this area. And who would say that these are mature sciences in the sense that physics and chemistry? Are? I mean, they seem pretty different as creative fields go. 
So it seems like you should say, like Kuhn should say, as Popper says, you know, um, what I'm doing myself here is not part of what I'm describing. What I'm doing here is not a mature science. Um, however, as we'll see, um, there sometimes seem to be really strong hints that he does think that his description of what goes on in a scientific revolution applies to what he's doing in this book. Um, right, that what he's trying to do is to replace the old, to introduce this term a little bit too early, paradigm. To replace the old paradigm in history or philosophy or sociology of science um, with a new paradigm and like this some kind of analogy or identification between what's happening here and what happens when you replace Newtonian mechanics with relativity or whatever. So um, it's not clear how to reconcile those things. And I, and I think there'll be a lot more material to go on as we go through the book. So I'm not going to say more about this now, but it's just a question to keep in mind. Um, okay, so um, so what is the like received view that Kuhn is reacting against? I think um, I mean there's actually there's actually two stages to what he's reacting against. Um, like in the first stage, he basically is agreeing with Popper that you can't think of science in one way. But then as he goes on, he also rejects Popper's alternative answer. So that um, so the kind of pre-Popper view um, is The one he was talking about, um, or the one he was um, agreeing with Popper and attacking in that quote that I read from page two. Right? He calls it development by accumulation. Or, yeah, develop, development by, by accumulation. Right? So the, so the thought is here that, you know, like if you open a modern chemistry textbook or whatever, it will, it contains, you know, a kind of summary of everything we now know about chemistry. And the history of chemistry just consists of people discovering one of those pieces, you know, each of those pieces, one after the other. Um, so, you know, um, uh, so a kind of history of science would consist of like determining who discovered X, who discovered Y, who discovered Z, and listing them in the right order. Um, um, and so like, I mean, I think the people who believe now, I mean, this is also complicated. Remember, I said there's there's like a paradigm or something like it in the history of, of science and and or in philosophy of science. It, it seems like, although he doesn't, it's not completely clear about this. It seems like there's both, and that like somehow this one is. Is more fundamental and harder to overcome than this one, or something like that. I'm not sure exactly how to sort them out, but the point is um, um, that I think this view of the, of the history of science, um, which, you know, I mean, is kind of maybe still the view you get, like in a science textbook, you know, the old picture of, you know, the genre or whatever on the side. <laughs> And we'll say he discovered X, right? 
So, um, but I think this view of the history of science is goes along with an inductivist view about the method of science. Right? This development by accumulation is the same one that Copper talked about when he it's when he said that they like inductivists seem to have a good explanation of scientific progress. As time goes on, we get more and more data. More and more data means number one, our old theories become better justified. But number two, we get you know data that will allow us to further generalize our old theories. Or I guess you could add also um, add more detail to them. Too, right, I don't, Robert didn't really talk about that, but um, so uh, <clears throat> um, and so, like, if that's the way you understand why there's progress in science, and then you see something like this come up along the way. Um, well, it can only be explained as an error. It's a myth, it's an error, something irrational happened. Because, you know, uh, like, again, as the data come in, we have more and more data that support the correct theory, basically. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, you're not, your, your chemistry textbook is. Therefore, for the same reason, not going to include a little thing on the side that says, you know, so and so discovered phlogiston. Because <laughs> we don't think there is phlogiston, so no one discovered it. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, this is what Kuhn says, and this is basically the very beginning of the book. He calls it, um, but anyway, he calls this the image of science that has us in its grip. That's an allusion to Wittgenstein. To like later Wittgenstein, um, which there's definitely some relationship between Kuhn and later Wittgenstein. We'll see him actually, like, you know, uh, dis discuss Wittgenstein explicitly at some point. Um, whether his reading of Wittgenstein is, is very good, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's that's a pretty high standard because Wittgenstein is impossible. So, anyway. Um, uh, so that's the image that has us in its grip. I guess, I mean, so that wasn't just a that wasn't just a random aside to say that's an illusion to Wittgenstein. It's you know the it's it's an initial hint again that what Kuhn is doing here is going to be similar to what he says happens in science during a revolution. Which is also similar, he says, to what happens when we um, when we like switch from seeing the duck to seeing the rat. One image had us in its grip, and then another one, right? So, um, but anyway, this is the image that has in its grip, but. Um, it's uh, when you actually try to apply this and use it the way you've been taught that it can be used to discover who just dis to discover who discovered each thing at each time, you find out. Kuhn says you you become increasingly frustrated. You find that there are no good answers to those questions. The more you know about it, the harder it becomes to say who really discovered oxygen or whatever. Um, and um, moreover, I guess the other part of it is that when you, if you start studying this, you start realizing that you can't find any errors, right? That like the things that these 
people or these men. This is it's an interesting phenomenon, actually. So this book was published in Berkeley, or I don't know where it was published, but it was ranked a sign Berkeley, California, 1962. So it's like for some reason, I mean, it's not as if people in the 17th century don't use men in a way that raises our eyebrows, but it seems like as you get closer to the time when people are suddenly going to realize there's something wrong with this, it gets like more insistent. <laughs> like there's something in this, there's something about the way he uses men in this book that's like, it's like a drum. It's these men, these men. Anyway, I, I don't, I can't speculate whether there's really some great world historical reason for that, or it just has to do with like how style people were taught to write in in the 60s, or I don't know, but obviously I'm not going to talk about it every time it happens. That I think there is one place I can never find it when I maybe it's one of my notes I'll find it. There is one place where he seems to say, like, it's kind of like a smoking gun, where he uses men when he's talking about scientists, and then he says, or other people. <laughs> but anyway, be that as it may, so these, what, um, you know, what characterizes uh that 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 these people what they're doing is indistinguishable from what the people we call scientists are doing so um so that's why we're going to reject this picture and then that um the alternative which he doesn't fully develop at any point, which I think is clearly the going alternative to what he's doing, and it's is is Popper's solution. Well, you know, what characterized these people as scientific was not that they had some rudimentary version of our current theory, right? That they had like some of the facts that we have, but not all of them. It was that they have the right methodology which is consistent with having basically anything. Right? So the methodology doesn't tell you what to believe. It tells you, given what you believe, what you do. Um, so, but Kuhn also rejects this one. And why does he reject it? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, like I said, it's a little bit hard to tell because he doesn't develop this fully in order to attack it. Um, he just like shows piecemeal that this isn't a way out, I think. Um, but first of all, he points out that what characterizes mature science, or he points out, he claims anyway, but based on his historical research, that what characterizes mature science as opposed to both the immature phases of those same fields and other fields that are not mature sciences now is consensus. It's consensus about something or other. Now, I mean, it's partly consensus about fundamental theories. So that there's certain basic facts about the world that everyone in the field subscribes to. Um, but, um, but Kuhn says that it's not just that. Um, it's consensus about other things like experimental methods or um, um, standard uh, instruments and how you expect them to behave. Um, and uh, because the mature science has this, or maybe this is a restatement of the same thing, mature science has this 
consensus means that the people of the mature science are not arguing with each other about such fundamental issues. Um, and that, so first of all, that clearly is, um, you know, right as, right as opposed to, he says, right, like if you look, into the history of optics before Newton, for example, you'll find various different incompatible ways of looking at light, um, kind of arguing with each other. <laughs> um, if they, depending on which way you look at it, you're going to emphasize different facts about light. Um, but there's no consensus in the field about how to, you know, overall how to choose which facts are important. And so those facts don't settle into dispute for anyone. Yeah. What a good way to distinguish between like Popper's view and Kuhn's view is Popper's view. There, there is a specific methodology that I determine, like that me, Popper, has determined. Whereas for Kuhn, it's like there is a specific methodology that we all have to agree on for it to be considered a science, like that the field itself has to agree on, or is it? You know, it's interesting that you put it that way. I mean, it's similar to the way some people sometimes describe Kant. I think in Popper's case, maybe it's more deserved that, um, that yeah, he does have this sound that he's trying to impose his view on everyone else. Um, and he did have that personality to him also. <laughs> right? I mean, he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't a patient person. And, um, <laughs> Uh, he wasn't particularly tolerant <laughs> of people who disagreed with him, despite what you might think from the contents of his view. Um, uh, but I mean, but officially, of course, according to Popper, it's not true that scientists should follow this methodology because Popper said so. But scientists should follow this methodology, and they do follow this methodology because it's the rational thing to do. Um, and in a sense, I mean, this is like one of the strongest, I mean, this, this, the connection I just made with Kant is not coincidental, right? Like in a sense, no specific agreement is necessary because everyone who's rational has already agreed. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, that you know that's precisely why you couldn't do it because someone told you to. that would be irrational or you know as Kant would say you know your action is without moral worth if you do it because i said the categorical imperative is blah 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 then your action is without moral worth um right and proper unlike Kant, doesn't seem to worry about I think Kant is actually worried, therefore, about the risks of doing moral philosophy. One of the risks is that people might start doing it because you told them to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a, like strictly analyzed thing about like community numbers. Like, what is Kuhn's conception of community consensus? You know, is this like you know everyone who I read who agrees, or I feel like this notion of a consensus needs to be a bit. Of, it, uh, like not very critical. Well, so, uh, I mean, okay, so like part of, I mean, maybe I should have said a little more about what this consensus is and what it isn't. Um, the, you know, this consensus is not necessarily something you can tell because all the scientists respond to a questionnaire and tell you know answer all the questions the same way or something. In fact, the contents of the consensus are not usually expressed that often, except in textbooks. Maybe. Right. So, um, um, and as I was saying, Kuhn thinks a lot of the contents of the consensus are not even like the practitioners might not even be able to. Last 
right? Because they, they're not about necessarily about beliefs. They're about ways of doing things, which questions are important and interesting and which are not. And they might not be able to tell you. So, I mean, this is supposed to be a historical uh, observation, so to speak, right? That if you look at these literatures, you'll find that they aren't characterized by a kind of argument that that you do find in other fields and in the previous phases of these fields, right? So if you look far enough back in the history of physics or chemistry or whatever, you'll, you'll find that they look more the way anthropology does now, let's say, or the way philosophy does now, for that matter. Right? You'll, you'll find that, um, you know, there's schools of people who disagree on the most fundamental questions about what the field is, and they're constantly arguing back and forth about that. Um, so I guess that might be wrong. I don't think there's something, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I don't think there's something fundamentally confused about it it's, or like kind of, uh, yeah, it might be hard to draw the line or whatever, but I mean, moreover, I, I actually, from what I've seen, it's 100% right. There is a huge difference between what he's calling mature sciences and these other areas in precisely this respect. Yeah. So we felt like trying to get consensus. Like sometimes most people like they agree and that's how maturity works. We felt like having this imperative rationality. Well, this doesn't, I mean, so part of what I'm getting to, this is going to be the disagreement with Popper, is that it's not possible to explain this consensus by appealing to rationality, right? But um, um, but if, you're, if your question is, like, is Kuhn telling people, get this consensus, and then you'll become a mature science. Um, so, uh, First of all, I think we'll see, I mean, I think we've already seen the reading for today, although whether I'll get to this part or not, I'm not sure. But I think, you know, um, it's not at all clear how Kuhn feels about mature sciences and whether he would advise you to make your field of mature science if you have a choice or not. Um, so, I mean, he's certainly not writing from the viewpoint of like how to do it. Um, but moreover, I think Kuhn would also say that, like, um, yeah, it's not just something you can do. The way the first paradigm is established is, you know, um, certain histor a certain historical process has to happen. You can't, ju you can't just make it happen. So, um, Which uh, is not to say that some people haven't understood Kuhn that way. Um, but I don't think that's what he means. Um, okay, so anyway, so getting back to this. So, I mean, this thing about consensus, maybe I should kind of get to it, consensus. Um, Um, this was something that actually Carnap also identifies as a feature of science. If you remember in the preface to Alpha, Carnap talks about how philosophers are always building up new systems from scratch, but scientists are able to build one on another. Um, uh, so, um, um, so again, this this I, like. Of a, the explanation in Carnap has got to be different, but nevertheless, it's, this isn't a direct attack on Carnap. But for Popper, um, well, um, he doesn't exactly ever explain why. The decision to accept a theory isn't just a personal decision. Um, 
And he, he doesn't discuss the kind of political structure that science would need in order to ensure that it's not just a personal decision. Lagatosh talks about that some. And so does Fire Robin, who, um, um, as I said, was someone who was like a follower of Popper, but who opposed Popper in certain ways. And, you know, I think one of the things that Fire Robin uh, thought Popper had gone wrong on was saying that, that, that scientists should try to agree on what theory to accept. And he thought that Popper had gone wrong in that specifically because that would require an oppressive political structure. So, I mean, so uh, this was the Popperian that, that Kuhn was in the closest contact with, actually, probably. So, um, so I think, uh, like, at least from Kuhn's point of view, the fact that even the fact that the mature science has this kind of consensus is already a worry inside for Popper's view. What these people are, are supposed to all have in common is a methodology, but that doesn't ensure that they agree with each other. Right? Like it was said before, having the, the right methodology is consistent with believing almost anything. So if they do agree with each other, and if moreover, and I guess I've been, I haven't said this straight out, but I've been hinting at it anyway, it seems like this consensus is somehow really important to the possibility of what we call scientific progress. It doesn't seem like it's an unfortunate feature of the field that we should try to get rid of. Because this is what allows, again, as Carnap says, you know. Um, instead of every scientist writing a book, principles of physics <laughs> that starts from like the definition of matter and goes on from there, um, they, that's already all settled. <laughs> Not again explicitly, like if you ask physicists what's the definition of matter, they most of them won't probably have anything very good to say. Right. So, but nevertheless, it's settled in the right way that allows physicists instead to produce papers that say, you know, new measurement of the so and so spectral line or whatever. Which, by the way, I think was what Kuhn uses that example sometimes. And I think that's what Kuhn himself is working on in his doctoral work, like determining the uh, um, precise wavelength of certain spectral lines. <laughs> um, it's what he often, he often uses an example of a case where everything about the result is already expected except for the most esoteric and extrinsically uninteresting detail. <laughs> like, I mean, we already know it's, you know, point one two seven, but we're not sure what the next digit is, and that's what I'm going to try to find out. <laughs> so, um, um, but nevertheless, it's because, like, at least it's plausible because scientists can write papers about stuff like that, that they can start to accumulate knowledge. So, uh, um, so, and I think, um, who sums up the problem that I was just raising on page three when he says, um, um, this is the bottom of page three. What aspects of science will emerge to prominence in the course of this effort? First, at least in order of presentation, is the insufficiency of methodological directives by themselves to dictate a unique substance of conclusion to many sorts of scientific questions. Instructed to examine electrical or chemical phenomena, the man who is ignorant of these fields, but who knows what it is to be scientific, may legitimately reach any one of a number of incompatible conclusions. Right, so again, this consensus, so Popper's answer is methodology. 
when methodology can't explain this consensus. So, um, I mean, Kuhn is going to have something to say about what does explain this consensus, but it's not things that Popper would predict, <laughs> right? He says what explains this consensus is the rigidity of scientific education. You are not encouraged to question the fundamental assumptions of the people. Um, um, you aren't, again, you aren't even necessarily taught the fundamental assumptions of the field explicitly. You're just given examples. You have to solve certain problems. You have to learn how to solve them the right way. And in solving the right way, you're starting to learn to think about the world the way the field requires you to. And as you go on, you know, to more advanced work, if you do, um, you know, the, it becomes um, less known in advance what the answer to the problem is, but it's still kind of the same type of problem that you were solving in the textbook. That's the way Kuhn explains this. Yeah. Um, so along those lines, if um, philosophy was taught in schools from the age of five, in like a I don't know which kind of way it was taught, but it was taught in somewhat similar way to um, the way um, math is taught, I guess, between something like that, too. Um, would it reach this mature status much before? Um, I mean, I don't know, because physics and chemistry aren't taught starting at the age of five or in math. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I. I don't know. He's, he's, he, when he talks about scientific education, he's mostly starting in like late high school or college. I think. Um, yeah, I don't know what he thinks about elementary math education. Mm -hmm. Elementary science education. It's kind of weird, but he doesn't talk about that. <laughs> um, but you know, what if philosophy were taught in college the way science is? Well, you know, again, I think maybe this is all kind of a long sentence, and maybe I should finish the sentence. But like, it's um, but the explanation that comes out at the end is not going to be. Um, Again, it's not like a recipe for how to make something into a mature science. These are characteristics of mature science because mature science has crossed a certain threshold. It has what Kuhn calls, I wrote it here, but I'll mention here, has what Kuhn calls a paradigm. But you can't just um, create that, you know, by fiat. It has to come about because, uh, like, a certain school, you know, of the pre paradigm period demonstrates its ability to solve the problems that everyone is most interested in at a certain time better than everyone else. And everyone kind of comes over to that school. And then, you know, because of that, they, they start to change the way they communicate with each other, the way they educate their students, and so on and so forth. Um, but you can't just like make that happen, I think, according to him. Now, I mean, in some ways, philosophy or the sub-disciplines of philosophy have started to look more like what Kuhn describes as normal science. Um, uh, in part because they're trying to look more like science. <laughs> um, I think, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not sure whether Kuhn would agree with me or not, that that's a disaster. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, you know, to some extent, like 
I mean, Venom is a disaster, but also it didn't, doesn't work. I mean, this is, I must have told this story before in this class about when I asked a mathematician friend of mine, um, I asked, you know, does anyone ever publish a paper in mathematics just to show that there's a, a problem in someone else's proof? Did I tell that story already? No? Oh, okay. So he said, well, I mean, no, if you find a problem in the proof, you contact the editors of the journal, they contact the author, and the author either fixes the proof or issues a retraction. Now, if you've ever read a philosophy journal, <laughs> you know that almost every paper <laughs> is like a defense of such and such argument against the object, the so and so objection, right? You know, why the previous defenses were no good, but mine is an improved version. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it's not at all like mathematics, or I mean, physics is a little bit different, but it's again, it's not at all like physics. It's, it, but it, I mean, but it, but it can achieve some of the stuff and thing into boxes character <laughs> um, without getting any of the progress out. Anyway, never mind that. That's kind of editorializing about philosophy. But right, so back to Kuhn. So right, he said, so sort of like if accumulation can't explain, can't explain what is the difference between mature science and other creative fields. And methodology also can't explain it. Um, then what does explain it? And Kuhn's answer is, well, well sure science has a paradigm. Uh, so I see I'm definitely not going to gonna get to the end of my notes, but I'll just keep going and see how far I go. So, um, so this term, so like, first of all, you know, whenever people talk about paradigm shifts and, you know, need a new paradigm and whatever, that's all Kuhn's usage. Right? Kuhn was the one who started using the word paradigm. Before that, a paradigm meant a pattern. I mean, that's basically what it means in Greek. Um, uh, also, Kuhn alludes to this as specialized. Yes, at least Kuhn thinks this is a subspecies of the larger species of pattern, specialized used in grammar. You know, like the, the, a verb paradigm, it's like the, you know, shows the whole conjugation of a verb. Um, but uh, but Kuhn is introducing it for his own purposes. It's his own technical term. And it's um, notoriously a problematic technical term in the sense that Kuhn seems to use it for several different things without much warning of you know, going between them, if any. Um, now, I mean, you should be suspicious of notorious things like that. <laughs> but, uh, but in this case, at least Kuhn himself later on did say that he unfortunately had used the term paradigm in two different ways. I think a lot of people would say there are more than two different ways. But anyway, he says the two different ways are sociological versus exemplary achievements. So the official definition of paradigm on page 10 is the exemplary achievement version. Um, In, this is before he introduces the term paradigm, actually, but this is where he's starting to talk about it. In this essay, normal science means research firmly based upon one or more past scientific achievements, achievements that some particular scientific community acknowledges for a time as supplying the foundation for its further practice. Today, such achievements are recounted, though seldom in their original form by science textbooks, elementary and advanced. Um, before such books became popular in the 19th century, many, many of the famous classics of science fulfilled a similar function, Aristotle's Physica, Ptolemy's Almagest, Newton's Principia and Optics. Right. So anyway, 
right? So this is the official, this is going to be the official definition of paradigm. The, a paradigm is like an exemplary achievement of um, someone in the past of the field, um, which now serves as the model for everyone going forward. And that's why it's called a paradigm. It's like a pattern or a model. But in neo Kantian, neo Kantianism, the, the forms are called paradigmatic causes because the things that instantiate them as their patterns. So, um, so, so this is a kind, so, so this is a kind of pattern. But then, as he says, he also uses paradigm in a sociological quote unquote way to mean the entire framework of assumptions, procedures, et cetera, that characterize a research tradition. So in that case, in that sense, we, so in one sense, we would say the paradigm of Newtonian uh, mechanics is Newton's Principia, or the achievement of Newton's Principia as now digested and regurgitated by textbooks. Um, but in another sense of paradigm, we would say the paradigm of Newtonian mechanics is like, the complete description of what this consensus is about, basically. What it is that all the members of the field have in common that directs them. Yeah. This is starting to sound pretty similar to the accumulation, like the first thing, kind of, where it's like what has worked in the past should serve as like a reference for moving forward, and then things that don't work are like a myth. It kind of sounds like that same thing, but you just get rid of the myth part. Well, I mean, so, I mean, one of the things he wants to explain is why this view seems correct if you get if you gather your history of science from textbooks and the and i mean he's he's only going to get to that later right he hasn't talked really except very broadly about paradigm change yet but um um well maybe i shouldn't say that now he hasn't said a lot about paradigm change yet but um but yeah, it's going to look like once you have a new paradigm, the work that was going to was done in the old paradigm, you're going to sort it out into the things that contribute to our current understanding of what solving a physical problem is, etc., and the things that don't, and the things that don't are going to be read out of the story. Um, whereas from the historian's point of view, we see that the old version of the field also had a paradigm, and according to their paradigm, all of that stuff is legitimate research. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not, what Kuhn is saying is not the same thing as this, but Kuhn is trying to explain why it seems to scientists themselves and to some of like naive historians of science like this, which is true. Um, so, um, um, so the important thing about a paradigm and this is also something that, that neither of these views really can see. The important thing about the paradigm is that it's rigid. Um, none of the work that goes on in the paradigm directly heal in what that is in periods of what Kuhn calls normal science, which apparently are supposed to be most of the time, right? So, um, uh, none of the work that goes on in normal science is um, in any way an attempt to justify or test the paradigm. The paradigm is, again, is the, is the, the assumptions, often unspoken assumptions, that everyone on the field has a challenge. Now, I mean, these assumptions do amount to a kind of rules of the game. Um, 
but they aren't rules of the game of science in Popper's sense, right? For Popper, he was trying to find out what are the rules. This can again just see your question, right? What are the rules for science, and like what the what can you be asking when you ask that? It means like what rules flow from the nature of rationality itself, basically. Right? So it's so it's it's analogous to, or maybe in Popper's mind, even a kind of subpart of the question we ask in morality when we ask, like, what are the rules? What is the law of nature? Something like that. Um, so not law of nature in the sense of like laws of nature or like conservation of momentum or something, but the law of nature in the sense I'm going to be talking about it in 144 next quarter, right? Like the law that isn't instituted by human beings but applies to everyone, even in the state of nature, the moral law, right? So um, that's what Popper's methodology is like. But these rules are not like that, at least in large part, they're not. Right, I mean, Kuhn, I think, is willing to leave open that maybe some of them are like that, but those are not sufficient, right? I mean, we need a lot more specific rules that have, as Kuhn puts it, a contingent content to them in order to get this kind of consensus which will allow normal science to go on. Certain type of questions are to be investigated in certain ways, and other type of questions are not to be investigated. They're not interesting questions, or if they are, they don't belong to our field, they belong to some other field. Um, so, um, um, and you know, uh, the rules in part embody like actual beliefs about the world. You know, um, like the reason a certain technique is guaranteed to, to succeed is because the world consists of tiny corpuscles or the world consists of a wave function, like, you know, or whatever. Like, but, but, so the paradigm in this broad sense, um, as well as in that narrower exemplary achievement sense does contain some theoretical content, um, but not all the rules exemplify that. And moreover, Kuhn says, you can't really just reduce the paradigm to a set of rules. Right? Like, and this is one of the places he, he um, refers directly to Wittgenstein. Again, whether the reading of Wittgenstein is right or not is a good question. But, you know, he says that um, you can't really say like by listing, giving a list of rules, what everything in the paradigm research has in common. Just as, at least supposedly, this is Wittgenstein's point, um, we can't give a list of, of all things that every chair has in common or every game has in common, but we recognize that they all resemble each other in a certain respect. Um, and so, like, Kuhn paraphrases that by saying, that the scientists do this by direct inspection of the paradigm without abstracting rules off explicitly. And it may not even be possible for the historian or the philosopher to discover some set of rules. All we can say is that they base what, they, what they're doing on the paradigm. Was Griffin, Griffin first? Uh, so would it be fair to say that the paradigm itself isn't like a falsifiable set of axioms. It's more of like a general understanding of the findings within the field that kind of set, not an unspoken rule, but like a set of standards, I guess, for how you're supposed to operate within the field. And it can't be directly falsified. It can only be changed through new discoveries within the field. Okay. No, it's so, I mean, so to the extent that it contains a theory, and I think sometimes Kuhn, concentrates really hard on that part of it and talks about the paradigm theory and almost seems to identify that with the paradigm. Whereas other times it's pretty insistent that it includes all this other stuff. But to the extent that the paradigm contains a theory, the theory is not falsifiable. And it's, but it, it's not falsifiable, not for some logical reason, but for the methodological reason that um, the activity of the field is just not aimed at calling it into question one way or the other. 
It's based on the assumption that it's true. Right, so like if you're trying to measure the strength of the gravitational, like the, the value of the gravitational constant by setting up some apparatus or whatever, um, you don't regard this as a test of whether there is a gravitational constant. If you can't get a consistent measurement, your apparatus isn't working. Yeah. Um, would it be like the same thing if you you know, hypothetically, present software after another testing, like, we're going to accept a theory or hypothesis, and you just put the open to if there's falsifying data, but maybe that's like nothing to care about, and that's been accepted already, and then you can take it from other things for a minute. Well, um, I mean, So according to Popper, uh, there aren't really other things. <laughs> I mean, science consists consists in testing our conjectures about the world. So you should be testing something. And you know, like this experiment, which I don't know why I wanted to do exactly this way. I, I didn't even know what the apparatus that this is Cavendish who says who first like build an apparatus to measure the, the uh, value of the gravitational constants. Um, so, you know, this apparatus isn't supposed to test anything. It's just supposed to get a more accurate measure of a number that the theory assures us is there to be measured. This is where we talk, this is like has to do with what he means by like stuffing into conceptual boxes. The theory says there is a number G, <laughs> big G, that, that characterizes the strength of gravitational interactions, right? The strength is equal to the, the magnitude of the force is equal to that, right? So um, um but the theory doesn't tell us exactly what this constant is. So the purpose of this apparatus is to stuff nature into this box. <laughs> right? like, so um, um, now, I mean, Kuhn says, and he says that even at the end of this reading, starting to build up to what he's going to talk about later, that Nevertheless, normal science will eventually be likely to be a really sensitive way of figuring out that the theory doesn't work, right? Because it suggests that we, it allows us to build more and more um, precise instruments that the theory tells us more and more precisely how they should behave. And eventually, if they stop behaving the way the theory tells us they should, then we realize that something is wrong. Although at first we don't know what, we don't think, because the paradigm research doesn't tell us how to assimilate these results. But we know something is wrong, right? That's what Kuhn calls an anomaly. So this normal science is good at eventually turning up anomalies. And sometimes an anomaly actually will lead to a, lead to a revolution and the establishment of a new paradigm. But it's not the aim of normal science to do that in any way. None of the things, right? So if you think of, remember, for Popper's criterion, everything depends on sincerity, right? Like the scientists are supposed to really be trying to test the theory. This is the opposite. The scientists are trying to do anything but test the theory, but against their will <laughs> and to their complete shock, <laughs> the theory runs into trouble. Um, so, I mean, if this is a correct account of the history of science, then I think it's right to say that Popper is in big trouble. Um, See, I'm out of time and I didn't even get to talking about puzzle solving, which is so important that I'm going to have to talk about that at the beginning next time. Um, but um, 
Yeah, we're out of time. So I'll see you then.